Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, we'll give everyone another 30 seconds to a minute to log on and then we will get right into it. Okay, I think we'll just get started and let a few struggles, stragglers trickle in as they come. Um, so hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar, Hidden Talent Within Your Community. My name is Audrey Anderson and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator at Golden Shovel Agency. We've also got Bethany Quinn, our VP of Strategy and Content Development with us today. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and type them into the question box in the control panel. And um, we'll have time to answer those at the end. And we will also be recording this webinar and sending you all a copy along with the slides. So be on the lookout for that in your inbox within the next 24 hours. Uh, so today we're presenting on a toolkit for engaging a largely untapped workforce presented by Brian Ingram and Doug Keyes. Um, Bethany, I will let you introduce our guest. Great, thank you, Audrey. And thank you everyone for being here with us today. We are very excited to have this presentation by the National Disability Institute. They are based in Washington, DC, but work all over the country. And part of their mission is building a better financial future for people with disabilities and their families. Something that definitely ties into economic development and the work that all of our clients are doing every day to make their communities a better place. Brian Ingram, who's one of our presenters today, he is NDI's training and technical assistant manager, Inclusive Employment Solutions. Brian is a nationally recognized SME on the integrated resource team approach and works with agencies in and outside of the public workforce system. He has a strong TA experience with career pathways and programmatic access. Doug Keast is NDI's project manager for the inclusive solutions team and has over 40 years in the field of disability and employment. Doug has worked in a lead role in multiple local, state, and national initiatives focused on disability and employment. In other words, these guys know quite a bit about the topic. They have extensive experience, have worked in the public and private sectors, and I'm incredibly excited to hear their insights today and share them all with you. So Brian and Doug, take it away. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Bethany, for that, that very kind introduction. Um, uh, I'm Doug Keast, and I'll start us off before turning it, turning it over to my uh, better looking and, and more intelligent partner here, Brian. Um, our objectives to begin with, uh, we'll be uh, hoping that uh, over this, this time that we'll spend together uh, this morning, that participants will gain a broader understanding of disability and the positive impact of the inclusion of people with disabilities in the industry of their communities. Uh, over the course of our discussion, we'll talk about strategies for companies to effectively demonstrate leadership in their communities with regard to disability employment. We'll also seek to develop awareness of the success stories that Brian and I have had an opportunity to, uh, to develop, to, to come into contact with, um, with regard to effective disability employment strategies engaged in by companies. So we'll start with who benefits. Society has changed in so many ways since I began in my career with regard to how people with disabilities are perceived with regard to work. To a certain degree, Expectations by businesses, families, and people with disabilities vary by generation. Back in my day, as I was getting started, the word disability meant that you can't work. 
Today, most of us see that it means that there might be some things that present difficulty in certain conditions for some people, but how that relates to the ability to perform specific job tasks is situational. There are situations that might stump us from time to time, but resources also exist to su support us with resolution. Healthy communities are defined by the level in which everyone living in the community is active in its economy. Let's start with the benefits of full engagement for everyone in work. Businesses definitely benefit in several ways, especially in times like these where many businesses are not able to fill all of their skill needs. There are untapped pools of talent out there, which include people with disabilities. Where these individuals are encouraged to gain work experience and build their skills in areas of interest, businesses benefit. But it's not about hiring people with disabilities as much as it is about hiring people who contribute to the business who might also have a disability. Businesses are starting to recognize that when their employees reflect the diversity of the community, it improves their market. And as we'll note in a bit, uh, one in five people in your community are likely to have a disability. This is just as relevant for having a workforce that equally reflects the community of individuals that are black, indigenous, and other people of color. Being a company where individuals with disabilities want to work, it also is important for businesses that have contracts with the federal government. As the awarding of many of these contracts consider the degree to which the business reports the inclusion of employees with disability among their workforce. Of course, full engagement in employment benefits people with disabilities. For most, making a decision to live on public support is a decision to live at a poverty level standard of living. When people drop out of the labor market, most enter into a complicated lifestyle built on low expectations. For people with disabilities, like everyone else, finding ways to engage interests and passions in career pursuits to support personal growth lead to greater satisfaction and accomplishment, as well as greater control in life decisions that are important to all of us. And this brings us around full circle. As mentioned before, the greater the degree that all people living in a community and are a part of its industry, the greater the overall strength and health of the community. There is both an economic and social welfare toll on our communities when there are increased numbers of people for whatever reason that become dependent upon the rest of us for support. There are several populations that might be challenged in pursuing careers as contributing members, but today we'll focus on people with disabilities. It is difficult to put a finger on exactly how many people there are around us that have disabilities largely because many individuals with disabilities do not disclose it or they see themselves or they don't see themselves as having a disability. We've seen some projections in which learning disabilities uh, are included that suggest the distribution is as high as one in four, but more often you'll see the one in five distribution. And this is a demographic that if you're not already part of it, we all have an opportunity to join. Disability is not homogenous in what it looks like or how it impacts us. There is a lot of diversity within disability. It can be sensory in nature. Uh, and those with hearing or vision loss are those that we usually think of in this group. Cognitive disabilities or intellectual disabilities are generally characterized by deficits in adaptive behaviors, learning, memory, perception, and problem solving. And we usually think of these folks as having a lower mental capacity. Causes for this condition vary. Mental health disorders include those that are uh, neuro neurologically based disorders of perception or thinking that create difficulty for people in their interactions with others and in decision making, unless properly supported and managed. Physical disabilities are seen as those that might limit mobility or dexterity. And we often think of people that use wheelchairs as among those with physical disabilities. Truly the largest subgroup here are those with learning disabilities, such as dyslexia. Learning disability interferes with how the brain captures and processes information for learning in a classroom setting. 
you will find a higher than average number of individuals with disabilities among those that are dependent on public support or those in or coming out of correctional facilities, among those over the age of 55 or homeless. And we mentioned this just to show uh, the convergence of disability in, in a number of uh, target populations that we look at. Because they are less likely to be employed right now, you'll find greater percentages of people with disabilities in low income neighborhoods intersecting or coexisting with other populations that are also underrepresented in employment. While the challenges for many minorities in their inclusion in the workforce in communities are different for people with disabilities, where conditions of disability exist for people that are black, indigenous, or people of color, the conditions of poverty and challenge are exacerbated. When it comes to disclosure, we find that the numbers are a bit lower. Uh, by self-report, 12.7% of the population reported having a disability in the 2019 US Census. But as we mentioned earlier, the proportion of people with disabilities grows as we grow older. 33.5% of Americans over 65 report having a disability. Also significant is the comparison of people with disabilities and people without disabilities that are working. According to the US Census in 2019, only 19.3% of people who reported having a disability were working, while 66.3% of people who didn't report having a disability were working. Here's a different picture of the comparison of the difference in employment rates for people with disabilities and those without. This one by age group. According to this chart, youth 16 to 19 years of age with disabilities start out significantly less employed than their classmates without disabilities at 17.3% employment to 28.9%. But this is the closest they get in comparison. The gap widens as they get older. People with disabilities at their high point in terms of employment are in the 25 to 34 years of age group at 39.1% of employment. While those without disabilities hit their high percentage when they are in the 45 to 54 year age group with 79.4% employment. Well, that's it for the numbers. Um, now we're going to transition to my colleague, Brian Ingram. Thanks, Doug. Hello, everyone. Well, aren't those employment numbers Doug was going over with your uh, going over with you eye opening? Uh, they point to some real challenges people with disabilities face when looking for, getting, and keeping work. So we're definitely going to be talking more about these challenges as we move forward with our presentation. Now, that being said, a lot of pretty common assumptions about why people with disabilities are challenged by employment, and more specifically, challenges to employ, <laughs> that I'd like to take a look at now. So let's just call them myths. So these myths are like roadblocks that interfere, interfere with the ability of persons with disabilities to get and keep jobs. These roadblocks are often composed of commonly held and very limiting assumptions, coupled with a lack of direct experience with the issues involved. Listed above or below <laughs> are some common myths and, the, and then the facts that tell the real story. So here's a myth. Hiring employees with disabilities increases workers' compensation and insurance rates. Now the fact behind that myth is that insurance rates are based solely on the relative hazards of the operation and the organization's accident experience, not on whether they have uh, workers that experience disabilities. Here's another myth. Persons with disabilities are unable to meet per performance standards, making them a bad employment risk. Here's some facts. In 1990, DuPont conducted a survey of 811 employees with disabilities and they found that 90% rated average or better in job performance compared to 95% for employees without disabilities. A similar 1981 DuPont study, which involved 2,745 employees with disabilities, found that 92% of employees with disabilities rated average or better in job performance compared to 90% of employees without disabilities. 
1981 study results were also comparable to a 1973 job performance study that DuPont did. Here's another myth. Considerable expense is necessary to accommodate workers with disabilities. Well, here's the fact. Most workers with disabilities require no special accommodations and the cost for those who do is minimal or much lower than many employers believe. Studies by the Office of Disability Employment's Policies Job Accommodation Network have shown that 15% of accommodations cost nothing. 51% cost between $1 and $500 and only 22% of them cost more than 1,000. Here's another myth. People with disabilities don't have to or don't wanna work. Doug talked about this a little bit in his slide that he uh, went over earlier about how people with disabilities who decide not to look for work and become dependent upon uh, services provided by the federal and state and local governments really have a very low standard of living and live in poverty. So what I guess what I'm saying is that people with disabilities wanna work for all the same reasons that you and I do, to improve their standard of living support their children and family, and to be connected to their communities, and also to have the opportunity for a financially secure future. So here's another myth I hear a lot. Under the ADA, an employer cannot fire an employee who has disability. And boy, is that not true. <laughs> now, under the ADA, employers can fire workers with disabilities under three conditions. But let me tell you, the conditions are very broad. So they can fire someone uh, for a reason that is unrelated to the disability, or they can fire them because the employee does not meet legitimate requirements for the job, such as performance or production standards with or without a reasonable accommodation. Finally, you can fire someone with a disability under the ADA because the, of the employee's disability even. So if that uh, employee's disability means that he or she poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others in the workplace. So if all of these limiting assumptions are myths and easily disprovable ones at that, why don't more people with disabilities get and keep jobs? I mean, we looked at the numbers and it doesn't look good. Well, unlike the myths we just addressed, most of the real challenges for uh, uh, people with disabilities that wanna work focus on a lack of opportunity for example, there's lack of opportunity for post-secondary education, including college and vocational training, to gain knowledge and skills that allow people to get better jobs. There's a lack of opportunity around ongoing planning to promote job uh, advancement and career development. There's a lack of opportunity around fair and reasonable wages and benefits. There's a lack of opportunity around self-employment and business ownership. There's a lack of opportunity around the ability to explore new career directions over time. There's lack of opportunity around work and working and increasing earnings and building assets without losing eligibility for needed public benefits. I would argue that these are the real reasons that people with disabilities have such a, have so many challenges involved with entering the workforce. Doug, if you could progress the slide. So let's talk about employing people with disabilities from a business perspective a little bit more. And let's think about risk versus benefits. You know, the essential measure of whether an idea makes sense to a business is bottom line, right? Let's use this measure for the issue at hand. And since I'm an optimist, I'd like to look at the benefits of hiring people with disability first. So some of the benefits to a company in hiring somebody with a disability could include an increased hiring pool, which let the company kind of uh, take advantage of more people with more skills and fill their jobs more appropriately and more effectively. Um, there's data that shows that uh, uh, employing people with disability positively impacts the retention of your existing employees. And I think this is mostly because uh, the flexibility that is often used in uh, employing people with disabilities is also of great benefit to the employees that you already have. 
there's also a direct return on the investment. So there's tax and other financial incentives, including productivity benefits uh, that, that are attached with employing people with disabilities at your company. There's of course gonna be an increased diversity of your workforce. Uh, there's also a response to an aging workforce. So the productivity of people you already have. You know, based on our data, I would say you're probably already working, you probably already have employees who experience disabilities, whether they've disclosed that or not. And disability is the one demographic that folks can age into and often do. So as your employees work with you for longer and longer periods as they get older, there's a higher chance that they're going to experience disability and the ability of your company to adapt to that uh, helps you to keep them and all of their experience and uh, know-how uh, at your disposal for your company. Um, it's going to increase stability. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but people with disabilities, they need to work and have a unique set of challenges to face when dealing with a gap in employment. So if they find an excess, a successful position with you, it's gonna be of great value to them. Um, hiring people with disabilities can also give your company a new perspective on creativity and problem solving. And again, I touched on this a little before in thinking about how to accommodate people and thinking about how to use people, um, you know, focus on their strengths and address some of their challenges, you're going to gain perspective on a lot of other things and a lot of other employees. Um, that's something that we've seen over and over again. Finally, it, it can help you become poised for future preference in government contracting. Uh, moving forward, there is going to be a very large focus by the federal government on making sure that they're awarding contracts to companies that have a diverse workforce. Um, this, this kind of activity, thinking about seeking out and successfully employing people with disabilities can definitely give you a step up if you are uh, the kind of a company that is considering going for a federal contract. So now that we've looked at some of the benefits, let's look at the risks of hiring people with disabilities. But just because we spent a lot of time on the last slide discussing while, why a whole host of limiting assumptions on this topic were easily addressed, let's leave those assumptions out of this discussion. So without those concerns, what's left? Well, I would argue that what's left is thinking about the real barriers we also discussed, associated with a lack of opportunity for a person with disabilities, right? So educational, social, and professional gaps in experience that you may encounter with this demographic. So for a business to profit, to access all the benefits associated with hiring people with disabilities, they're going to need to embrace the risk of considering those challenges. You don't need to change what you do, your standards and expectations, but you might need to be flexible in how you do it. I need to invest some time and consideration into what including people with disabilities in your workplace could look like. And you may need to reach out to people and systems with resources, expertise, and a pipeline to the employees who could be so beneficial to you. It's not such a crazy thought, right? You need to invest to get a return. You need to assume a little risk to accrue benefit. So what does this look like? Let's take a look. Next slide. Well, to begin with, the company can take the initiative. You can lead. Somebody has to if anything's going to change, right? But more than that, the best way to ensure that you're able to manage the risk associated with obtaining the benefit you see is to step up and define the effort, its focus, its goals, and its outcomes. There's a rich and varied community of agencies and individuals that focus on employment for people with disabilities. Within this community, there are huge amounts of both resources and expertise that could help your business to address the risk and get to the benefits of employing workers with disability. These next six slides can serve you as a checklist for community leadership with regard to the inclusion of qualified workers with disabilities. 
we, we're going to look at things that you can do both internally within your business and externally with your community of agencies and individuals. So let's start by looking at internally first. One of the things you can do is to address accessibility, both physical and communication uh, within your own firm. So think about it a little bit. Think about your website. Is it accessible? Can you reach customers with disability? And also it goes beyond that too. Uh, your hiring practices, your onboarding practices, your actual business practices within your company. You know, uh, uh, can they be modified or are they now inclusive of folks who might use a little bit different method to get to the same place? Um, you can establish a welcoming environment for employees with disabilities in your corporate work culture. You know, this is something that is simple, but also very important, you know, making sure that your employees understand that uh, disability is, is not, you're not going to allow that to be limited, that you're open to discussing it and you're open to looking at different solutions to help an employee or a customer get to a place where things are functioning the way that they ought to. Uh, you can review and develop operational practices around recruitment, hiring, productivity enhancement strategies, and career uh, advancement paths within the company. You can, uh, you can engage employee support and uh, look at your discipline and termination procedures. Uh, you can engage in community mapping activities that identify disability related resources within your community that can increase your company's success with meeting your diversity and employment objectives. You can also review and develop operational practices around recruitment, hiring, productivity, enhancement strategies, career, yeah, we covered that before, but all of that's there. So basically you can look at all of the things that you already do in your company through a disability lens. You can think about for a moment whether you have the capacity uh, to be flexible enough to include people with disability in the activities that are going on in your workplace. And if somebody's coming to you with the skill sets that are valuable to you, I would argue that it is a worthwhile effort to think about these things because you're not gonna get the benefit of those skills and experience without the flexibility to uh, help, a, help somebody, an employee with disabilities reach their full potential with your company. Now, we can also look at some activities that a company can do externally that can help with this process. Uh, you can look at community mapping, and I know we'll talk about that a little bit more later, that's gonna identify disability-related resources within your community that can increase your company's success with your diversity and employment objectives. You can make use of strategies, uh, many of which we'll talk about more, that's within this, the disability employment community uh, to your advantage. So the use of apprenticeships, internships, and mentorships. These are really wonderful strategies because there's a flexibility built into them. And you can take advantage of to accommodate people with different needs. Um, you can create in, internal affinity groups. We'll talk more about that later too. These are groups of folks that have the same affinity, disability, for example, that work for you, that meet together to discuss issues around that topic um, in the context of employment in your workplace. Uh, you can set up an employer resource network. So you can, you can put together a bunch of uh, companies and uh, folks who are looking for uh, folks for their workforce who are interested in tapping into that disability pipeline. Uh, take advantage of the job seekers that have the skills they need within the dis uh, disability community. You also can do something called a business community academy. Uh, that's something that you can do in which a business, in this case, decides to convene folks from business and industry and the folks in the disability employment community. Just get together, get to know each other, talk about what you do and how you do it, and think about ways you can work together more effectively to get to the outcome you all want, which is to tap into that pipeline of qualified workers with disability. So there's a lot more here, and we're gonna, as I said, we're gonna spend a few more slides talking about it, 
But to look a little bit deeper into it, I'm gonna pass the uh, talking stick to Doug. Doug, are you ready? I am, Brian, thank you very much. And, and uh, 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 thank you for going through uh, all of those steps. Uh, uh, we're going to look at each one of these and perhaps go just a, a little bit more in depth uh, on the points that Brian addressed on the internal strategies and the external ones. And I'll start with the internal ones. Uh, as Brian suggested, we do first look internally. Do our corporate objectives or the values of our company say anything about the importance of having a diverse workforce? Change may or may not be desired, but if it is, change of this na nature is usually intentional. For all of us, behavioral change always begins with a we do, we will, or we value statement. If we're already saying who we are, who we're going to be, or who we value, this is a start. If we value diversity, does our definition of diversity include disability? Does our vision of our customers and who we, who we are include people with disabilities? It is important to think about how important it is for our company to include people with disabilities in that picture. Low importance equals low commitment. But if it's a high importance, then it should generate a high commitment. Balancing importance with commit, commitment then brings us to the next point, capacity. Do we have the capacity to realize our objective, whether it is with regard to our awareness and knowledge about disability and commitment to a level playing field for all of our employees and potential employees? Do we understand what this means and what is required for compliance with equal opportunity? The Americans with Disabilities Act is all about civil rights. And the fact that you are having this conversation with us today indicates that this is important to you. Are your company policies and procedures reflective of this in a way that will inform behavior and employment practice that meet your objectives for inclusiveness? This might be one of the most important sections to consider in evaluating your standing as a community leader in modeling a diverse workforce that includes people with disabilities. Is your language around disability there to meet compliance or are you truly communicating that your company wants people with disabilities as a part of its workforce? If so, is this message heard and understood? When we talk to people with disabilities, whether customers, applicants or employees, do they hear that we're friendly, resourceful, knowledgeable, and responsible? Or do they hear that we're compliant? Or do they hear something all of the above? And would people with disabilities enjoy or want to work in our company? If a couple of people with disabilities are walking down the street, would they point to your company and say, my buddy who is blind works there and he loves it and they treat him really well. He wants to work there a long time and I want to work there too. In wrapping up with the internal scan, we're back to our company's values and thinking about the image we wish to portray. We consider the view of the company as part of the community in which we operate. Does our workforce reflect the makeup of the, our community and look like our customers demographically? From a value standpoint and a marketing standpoint, is this important to us? And do we see a value in it? For many of us here, if not all, it is important to be a place in which people wish to work. So we place a value in the growth and success of those working in the company. Those companies here today that have made employees success a part of their corporate values take real steps in feeding this growth and often in ways that are celebrated and recognized by other companies and community leaders. How does the support for employee growth include people with disabilities? A common value held by many companies is that the success of a company also benefits the lives of people in our community. This is yet one more opportunity to consider how this includes those in, your, in our community that have disabilities. And now we'll step back and, and Brian will visit. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, so now let's think about what your company can do externally 
to tap the pool of qualified and eager applicants with disability that we know exists in your community. And to start, I'll remind you of what we were talking about before. The best way for a company to minimize the risks and get to the benefits is to take the initiative and lead. I also mentioned that there's a large community focused on employment for people with disabilities that is composed of individuals with disabilities and the organizations that serve them. This community is a warehouse of resources and expertise that can be applied towards the risks you share. Many of these agencies are government supported. The main government supported systems that has resources, expertise and reach into the pool of job seekers with disability is the workforce system, or WIOA. WIOA stands for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which is federal legislation that connected a number of federally funded employment services under one set of rules. This has created a system that can address many challenges to employment simultaneously and help to address the opportunity gap people with disabilities often experience around employment that we were talking about earlier. This system often, uh, also, excuse me, also works with local companies and government to support efforts around economic development. And these efforts will often use resources from a variety of sources to increase economic activity in a region or city to the benefit of all. The workforce system also has a responsibility to convene groups and organizations locally, nonprofits, advocates, groups, etc., uh, to ensure that the services they provide are accessible to and useful for the job seekers and businesses in a community. So let's talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. WIOA services are the gatekeepers to talent, true, but they're more than that. They're reservoirs of resources and expertise for a diverse population of job seekers including job seekers with disability. I'm gonna go through a brief list of the services and the supports provided by WIOA providers. So WIOA services and uh, supports for adult and dislocated workers include an initial assessment of skills levels, orientation to information and other services available through the workforce system, job search and placement assistance, career counseling, the availability of support services or assistance and referrals to other workforce system programs and services, individual counseling and career planning, financial literacy services, internships and work experience that are linked to careers, on the job, on the job training, which also can include registered apprenticeship, entrepreneurial training, and skills upgrade and retraining. Now, Looking back at the conversations that we were having about the opportunity gap for job seekers with disabilities, this is a package that is really designed to address a lot of those opportunity gaps. And it's, it's a publicly funded system that is based on eligibility of an individual job seeker. So it's something that your company can benefit from at cost to themselves. So it's something to think about. So, Beyond the services that are provided to individual job seekers, applicants, they are, there are, there's also a menu of services that are provided to businesses directly. Let's take a look at those. And Doug, if you can address, uh, advance the slide. So WIOA provides a host of services to local area businesses to support their strategic use of current workforce trends and to help them to meet their own workforce needs. The scope of WIOA services available to local employers can vary from place to place, but it may include listing for job openings, locating job ready, skilled workers who meet their needs. Uh, WIOA service providers can host job fairs that benefit companies. They can develop and provide training for incumbent workers working together with one company or many companies to design the specific training that is relevant to their needs. They can provide on the job training stipends and work with businesses to provide on the job training opportunities, which is a great way to address a gap in experience, right? 
uh, they can provide connections to other partners and programs when necessary to meet the needs of a business. They can assist with employment retention, including the use of accommodations and assistive technology as appropriate. They can provide customized screening and referral of qualified participants in career and training services to employers. In other words, uh, they, can, they can feed people who are getting the training that you need right to you. Um, they can also uh, engage in activities to provide business services and strategies that meet the workforce and investment needs of area employers. So beyond that, WIOA providers can also training directly to companies and the staffing companies. So they can provide training and technical assistance to employers regarding the employment of individuals with disabilities specifically. So topics like working with employers to provide opportunities for work-based learning experiences, such as internships, short-term employment, uh, temporary work, and apprenticeships. They can recruit qualified applicants who are individuals with disabilities. They are linked to that pipeline, right? They can train employees who are individuals with disabilities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. They can provoke, promote awareness of disability related obstacles to continued employment. They can provide consultation, technical assistance and support to employers on workplace accommodations, assistive technologies and facilities and workplace access. They can also assist employers with utilizing available financial supports for hiring or accommodating individuals with disabilities. Remember, we were talking about the cost of accommodations. Well, not only are most accommodations really inexpensive, but even when they are, there are often multiple resources that can be accessed to defer that cost entirely for an employer. So all of these services can be applied to the needs of your company in hiring new employees with disabilities or even in some cases, providing training for current employees to increase their skills and productivity. And as I mentioned earlier, in fact, one of the examples we're gonna be discussing today involves a vocational rehabilitation agency assisting a business to skill up a current employee with a disability for a promotion, then working with the business to fill the original employee's open position with a qualified new hire who also experienced a disability. So we look forward to that. All right, Doug, if you can advance it. Okay, let's discuss some examples of strategies, both internal and external, that you can embrace to get the ball rolling. Um, I think today we should probably start with a reverse job fair. So unlike a traditional job fair, in which a company presents and tries to entice job seekers to apply for their openings, a reverse job fair is a job fair where the job seeker presents themselves to the business who needs applicants. So a reverse job fair helps job candidates highlight and showcase their skills and abilities in a comfortable environment. Um, it helps businesses to recognize the talents of the job candidates by watching them demonstrate examples of their work and abilities. So some of the bulleted benefits for businesses is a reverse job fair is gonna connect businesses with high quality but often overlooked applicants. It's gonna allow for a more relaxed conversation that is conductive to a more meaningful and customized exchange. In other words, if you're dealing with uh, an applicant that has unique pieces of information they wanna to communicate to you, sometimes a reverse uh, job fair is gonna be a better environment to get at that information. So it also provides a platform where the event organizers can pre-screen and assist to match job seekers to the positions that are needed by participating businesses that have provided essential job function information. So in this scenario, in a reverse job fair, all of the applicants are going to attend the fair with a high quality portfolio of information to share. Uh, information that's gonna include a resume, references, cover letters, that kind of thing, but also an inf information that's unique to them. Uh, you would wanna hire them and what they could bring to your company. So that is a reverse job fair. I also wanted today to talk about affinity groups. So affinity groups are a strategy that a 
company can implement internally. And the primary goal of affinity groups is to promote diversity, openness, and understanding. Inclusiveness. Affinity groups create a welcoming place for staff and employees who share common interests so that they can meet and support one another's personal and professional perspectives. All affinity groups are open to all employees. And employee participation in an affinity group is completely voluntary. So affinity groups can help create an inclusive workplace by serving as a vehicle for leveraging the unique and common perspectives, functions, and approaches to work uh, that are held by the group that shares an affinity, right? They can also contribute to an inclusive workplace by helping to attract and retain diverse candidates. As Doug was saying, you know, you want to create a welcoming environment. Well, having an affinity group associated with your company is about as welcoming as it gets, right? An affinity group can provide an informal welcome to new employees, as well as network and mentoring opportunities for their members as they work for your company and progress. They can create an open and welcoming space for staff who share common interests and concerns to meet and support one another. Again, sometimes the best expert to consult are the people with disabilities themselves, right? And an affinity group helps create a platform uh, to, for problem solving, where the people with disability bring their, their uh, knowledge and experience to the table to address concerns at the workplace. Um, it also can provide a resource to businesses regarding employee interests, needs, and policies. Again, I was talking about that a little bit before. Finally, we have, again, an abbreviated list of activities a business can engage in with their WIOA system to ensure a pipeline of qualified applicants with disability that are available and qualified for the openings that they're trying to fill. So again, thinking about setting up informational interviews. This is something that you can do with very little investment uh, with your local WIOA provider. So you get uh, applicants who are interested in your company and the work that you do, and perhaps are already on an educational path that are gonna provide them with skills and certifications that are relevant for your companies. And you set up an informational interview of 20 to 30 minutes with these clients, with these job seekers. So informational interviews are just that. They're kind of informal interviews. They introduce you to a job seeker and they introduce the job seeker, the applicant to you. Um, they can be done whether or not, actually I would say they are done uh, without the pressure of an actual opening being on the table. So they're much more, uh, they're much more relaxed, laid back. And also you can, I mean, they're a great way to pre-screen applicants, to identify folks you might be interested in that are right now sitting in the, uh, in the, in the workforce system uh, and will be looking for work in the near future. There's also internships. So, you know, internships are opportunities uh, for a applicant with a disability to address what I would say is an opportunity gap around work experience. And again, it's an opportunity for a company to take a very close look at not just an applicant, but also what it looks like to have that applicant working for them. So if there's concerns around accommodation, if there's concerns around portions of a, of a, of a, a job description and the applicant's ability to meet that, an internship is a great opportunity to test whether that person is gonna do well on the ground uh, without the commitment of employment on the employer's part and uh, also without the commitment of employment on the applicant's part. Now, there's no reason after an internship, you can't hire the applicant, but it's not mandatory. On the job training is an offer, is an option that is offered by the WIOA systems, the workforce system, in which a, a new hire for a business is has their wage subsidized. The, uh, the workforce provider works with the company to develop a customized training strategy for that, uh, that new employee. This is a wonderful place to think about, for example, accommodation, um, you know, around communication or, or around physical needs. Um, it's also a great way 
for a company to minimize the risk of taking on a new employee that experiences disabilities and maybe trying some new strategies around supporting an employee that they haven't tried before. So that's something that can be accessed through workforce uh, that could be of great benefit to a company who's interested in hiring and keeping employees with disabilities. And then what I like to say, the cherry on the top of on-the-job training is apprenticeships. So that's where a company actually works with the training provider and the workforce system to develop apprenticeships that reflect their needs directly. And again, we have, we have a lot more information on this. If you're curious, you can ask. But this is just, again, the sampling of how the workforce development system can be relevant in your quest uh, to deploy a diverse workforce. So now it's time for our examples. We have some very brief videos we'd like to share with you that really pull together what we've been considering today. And uh, to do that, I'm going to turn it over to our technical wizard, Doug. Doug, are you ready? Okay. Well, you don't hear those words together very often. <laughs> um, our, our, our first success story uh, is with a construction company in the state of Maine, which established an apprenticeship program, the last thing that Brian just talked about. And their first apprenticeship program, again, this company is working with the uh, Department of Labor Agency in Maine. And actually, as Brian was talking about the workforce system, uh, the system now in this it, it includes many different programs that come together and operate as a signal, single system in, in working with, uh, with businesses. And, and this is the same with the Department of Labor in Maine, which also includes the vocational rehabilitation program. Um, uh, this first apprentice that's shown here uh, is a gentleman with a disability. Um, and we'll start here. Green Reed is a heavy civil general contractor specializing in bridge, marine, and renewable energy projects. We offer great opportunities for career development and apprenticeship is our newest. Some of the major projects we've completed include Bull Hill Wind, the Bath Viaduct, Colby College Student Center, the Penobscot Narrows Bridge, and the Scarborough Over the Road Pooling Project. And we recognize that it takes skilled employees to accomplish these tasks. Green Reed recently implemented an apprenticeship program, and we'd like to introduce you to Jacob Lawrence. Hi, my name is Jacob Lawrence. I'm a carpenter apprentice with Reed and Reed. I started my apprenticeship program in March. My experience has been positive and I've learned a lot working here. I've completed over half of my apprenticeship and I've developed new skills along the way. I look forward to finishing the program and becoming a skilled carpenter and continuing my experience. Reed and Reed offers great opportunities for career development and apprenticeship is our newest. We support on-the-job learning and are, are enjoying seeing Jacob succeed as he advances through his program. He's gaining confidence and skill every day. I'd encourage you to take a look at the apprenticeship program for your future. If you're looking for an opportunity, consider joining the Reed and Reed team. We've got great training opportunities available for apprentices right now. Visit our website at www.read-read.com for more and information. This video was developed to promote uh, apprenticeship opportunities uh, publicly to, to other folks. And now we'll move to our next example. Brian, do you want to bring us into this? I do, Doug. I'd also like to suggest maybe that we wrap it up after this example for the sake of time. Sounds good. I just want to see the second video from uh, the VR. The link is on the uh, the links on the PowerPoint. And just really briefly, before we start, yeah. okay. <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> States Army for six and a half years. I was um, an all-wheel vehicle mechanic, and unfortunately, my career came to an end. Um, after I hurt my back when I was deployed in Afghanistan. After I got medically discharged from the Army, I came down back to Omaha and tried to become a mechanic here at Hill Brothers. Um, due to my back problems, I was unable to do so. 
Not being able to do what I loved so much, it it crushed me. Not being able to be a, continue to be a mechanic outside of the Army was something that was hard for me to face. Well, I went to Hill Brothers first, got an agreement, a hiring agreement to hire me on as soon as I finished the JTL. I went over and talked to JTL, seeing the price that it was going to cost. A little bit of a hit on me, hit hard, the price of what you have to pay to get your CDL. And I went back the next day after making sure that Hill Brothers would take me on. I got the verification letter. I went back and talked to Sherry at JTL, and she introduced me to CPAP. Sarah needed um, assistance for funding her CDL and going through that training at JTL. Uh, that was the primary um, thing that was kind of holding her back as she just didn't have the funds after uh, coming back from serving in the war. Um, she didn't have uh, the ability to go through training but has, had always wanted to. When she was presented with this opportunity, she was able to pursue her goal. To be a good CDL driver, I think, takes a lot of focus and discipline and self-motivation. So knowing that Sarah had all those traits already and was really practiced with those from her military life, uh, pretty much identified her immediately that she'd be a good driver for us. Yeah, I, I followed her along. Um, she reached out if she had any questions. You know, we worked through that, but Sarah was really good in training. So I followed through with her or followed up with her um, from, from day one when we met all the way through um, 90 days, uh, usually three months to make sure that she's happy um, and successful on the job, and, and she was, so. The credentials that I got from the CPAP program was I received my CDL, and received my hazmat endorsement, my triple-double endorsement, my tanker endorsement, and a certificate stating that I successfully graduated truck driving school. The freedom, I, I really enjoy the freedom, um, keeping everybody knowing that, seeing the country, I guess you could say, that's what I really, really enjoy. Okay, um, those couple of the, um... Uh, success stories we wanted to, to share. There's a one third, at, uh, a third one that, as Brian had said, uh, you can access the, uh, the link on the PowerPoint. Um, we're about a minute to go. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Bethany and Audrey, do we have time for a question or, or should we move on? Um. I probably will ask, I think we, if you don't mind, we are going to ask um, two quick questions. Obviously, we know people are starting to drop off because of the time, but you guys presented such great information. So thank you. Uh, one of the questions that was asked of us is how do we make space for uh, people with disabilities who are looking for jobs at organizations locally, but maybe are um, fearful to ask for accommodations? How do we how do we help make space for them to have those conversations? Doug, you want to handle this? You want me to? Um, uh, I'll, I'll give it a, a start. Uh, I thought you might. <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of it is uh, how you communicate and, and uh, that as people come in, uh, how, how, is, how are they made aware uh, that it is a comfortable space for them to disclose a disability, number one, that it, that it won't. Uh, work against them, uh, and how do they get information that uh, tells them how they can make the request? And, and it's always at uh, the application point, uh, but it's something that, that needs to be clearly communicated uh, in the employment parts of the process and in the training as well. Uh, and that's what we usually address when we talk about making it a, a welcoming environment. Uh, a lot of there is fear for a lot of folks, as, as the question implies. 